Our Grey Whale Census project is one of the longest running citizen science projects in the world. We're all volunteers, including myself. What we do is we have teams of generally between three and six, seven volunteers who are on site from sunrise to sunset in shifts. Some shifts are three hours, other people will come up to six hours. It depends upon what people are able to do because we're all volunteers and that's how we're able to keep the project going. So we have these trained volunteers, people that I've trained and uh, anchored by people who have a lot of experience with the project, who are watching from um, one direction to the other in certain sections, and we're looking for whales blowing, fluking, breaching, particularly focused on gray whales. Our main focus of our project is to count the number of gray whales passing by here. We're trying to look at how many are per group and if there's any calves and looking at the behavior they're doing. Besides gray whales, since we are out here from sunrise to sunset seven days a week, December 1st to about May 25th or so, we're also looking for different species of marine mammals and keep track of them, like sperm whales, blue whales, humpback whales, killer whales, minke whales, fin whales, sperm whales, bottlenose dolphin, common dolphin, white-sided dolphin, rhesus dolphin, uh, about 20 different species of marine mammals we have seen from this location. It's immensely uh, species rich, more than people would expect to see here. So on a given day, for example, this is our uh, education board, our whiteboard, that we keep track of what we see and we also use it to educate the public. So last year, as of March 20th, which was our last day of observation last year, we had seen 440 southbound gray whales, 867 northbound. We stopped right around the peak of the northbound migration. Our uh, cow-calf count, we had 35 southbound gray whale pairs, which is a fair number. And we had 13 northbound calves, which is unusually high for March, a very odd uh, count. So last year we had whales that were about two weeks late in their southbound migration. Uh, we saw a lot of skinny whales, didn't see a lot of calves. This, this year is actually the third year of what's called an unusual mortality event for gray whales, in which we've got a lot of whales that are, uh, thousands are dying up and down the shore. In 2016, the National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA Fisheries, they did an official count and estimated that the gray whale population at that time in early 2016 was just under 27,000. They did a similar count the beginning of last year of 2020 and that count had gone down to 20,500 about. So that was based on whales dying up and down the coast from Alaska to Mexico and also fewer calves being born. And many of the whales are super skinny so we think it's due to shifted availability of their food up in their feeding area. So gray whales are a medium-sized whale. They migrate from Alaska. Most of them are up in Alaska feeding in this area, the Chukchi and Bering Sea, and they take about two, two and a half months or so to migrate down the coast to Mexico. And then they spend time a couple months in Mexico, which are called the breeding and calving lagoons, four major lagoons in Mexico. And then they migrate back up the coast. So we see them going southbound, basically December, January, and beginning in the first half of February or so. And then we see them going northbound from about the middle of February to the end of May. The northbound migration has two pulses, the whales that don't have calves with them, and about four to six weeks to eight weeks later, the moms and calves come up from Mexico. So the last year and the last three years, we had whales coming down later, most likely looking for more food up in the Alaska area. They feed on benthic amphipods, little shrimp that lay on the bottom of the ocean. They lay on their sides, usually their right side. About 85% uh, or so are right lip, think about right-handed, left-handed. They curl up their tongue and they suck up the substrate. They scoop on the bottom and they feed on the bottom. And they eat all these little shrimps on the bottom, but they could also eat 
krill and fish and red pelagic crabs and herring eggs. There's over 90 types of food they can eat, but their favorite food are these little gamerid amphipods. And apparently there isn't enough of that available for them because we've had three years of skinny whales. So the, some problem, some issue is with their feeding up there. And we believe it's tied to climate change. If the water gets too warm, species move around and amphipods can't move around. We think the water might be too uh, warm for them and they might have died off in the area where they typically see them. So we're getting some more gray whales that are coming into places like the Los Angeles Harbor, Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, seeing gray whales feeding along the coast. There's about 250 gray whales that feed on the coast between uh, British Columbia and Northern California called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. And they see, for example, a whale that we've seen called Scarback, a big female that we've, I've seen three times from the census. She feeds off of Depot Bay, Oregon. And for two decades, they've seen this whale with a great big scar on her back. Last year, we saw her with a calf. That was really exciting. Saw her going southbound without a calf and northbound with a calf. So they spend their time in Baja. Now what's interesting, as a lot of people don't know, is that they, most of the females get pregnant migrating south. They ovulate in late November, early December. So there's breeding activity going down the coast as they travel in groups of two, three, four. The biggest group we saw was 23, January 20th, a few years ago. 23 gray whales at least traveling together, which was absolutely astounding. If they don't get pregnant at that time, female can ovulate about 40 days later, which could account for later season calves. There's been a lot of mating activity been reported recently in March. They're not gonna get pregnant at this time of year. They're just not able to because females aren't ovulating. So they're not necessarily mating um, just to have babies. They're just mating, socializing. So they go down the coast here and these are their nursery lagoons and they spend time nursing the calves who could nurse 12 to 20 times a day on milk that's super rich in butter fat, up to 53% butter fat, born maybe 12 to 16 foot long. We call them pickles, wrinkled pickles, really dark in color here and hanging out with the mom, a super strong mom and calf bond. Several births for gray whales have actually been documented. About half of them are head first and half are tail first. People think they've got to be born um, one way or the other and it's actually a bit of a mixture. Uh, the only other species of uh, birth has been seen for whales is humpback whale last year. It was a humpback whale female photographed with a baby's tail coming out of her. And they thought the baby didn't make it, but she was later seen with a live calf, which was fantastic. I've actually seen three afterbirths, three placentas of gray whales off our coast here, born right out here. And we had a birth uh, a couple miles away, right early in the morning. Actually saw a gray whale calf, uh, didn't see it coming out, but mom didn't have it. and then flailed around and then she had it and it took five hours to get across here and the calf flukes were all floppy and it couldn't swim right. So they will come down here and they'll stay down usually about three to eight minutes, three to five minutes on the average, dive down maybe 150 feet, maybe only five feet, come up to the surface, blow, their blow or breath will go up eight to 10 feet, often looks like a heart shape. They have two blow holes on top of their head. They go back down, which are like our nostrils, come up and often will fluke or raise their tail on that dive. Sometimes we'll see interesting behavior. We've actually seen nursing here, seen some milk in the water. This area is really important resting area for gray whales. Moms and calves will come into the cove here, rest in the kelp, spy hop, play, multiple cow-calf pairs and, and uh, singles will play around. Uh, we'll see breaching or jumping up out of the water. Spy hopping very occasionally, sticking their head up. There was a boat that went by really fast off here and with, there were two whales going by and one stuck its head up right as the boat went by, probably to take a look and see what, what was that. They have a couple of parasites on their bodies that give them a, uh, their color. These, white, these are white barnacles that are only found on gray whales except for one baby killer whale that came up in April of 1985, had a gray whale barnacle on its snout, and one beluga or white whale in San Diego Bay, it was part of the Navy facility, had a gray whale barnacle on it. The barnacles give off uh, the larva and they go through the water column and they settle down on the gray whales, it's supposed to be only the gray whales. The, these three species of lice, which are orange colored, that can crawl around on the whale and eat dead skin. So that gives them an orange coloration. Barnacles can give them white patches, and when barnacles die and fall off, give them white scars. Sometimes gray whales are just born with white pigmentation and markings. We identify, as scientists, 
the markings on the gray whale, basically from here to here, on the side of the body, grays don't have a dorsal fin, like a humpback whale does, for example. They have a series of knuckles, like the knuckles on the back of your hand, that give like a ridge pattern here. And then those blotches and birthmarks take a photo of the side of the whale, and that's how we tell one gray whale from, from another. So we have these gray whales that go by here, and keeping track of the different groups, and we give the groups numbers, like sighting number one, number two, number three, and so on. And then we'll track them across here and we'll look for particular markings on them so we don't get them mixed up. We might have eight or 10 sightings at one time. So we have multiple volunteers. Like if I spot a sighting, then I would typically be in charge of that sighting. That would be my sighting. And if another sighting is spotted, then someone else will be in track of that. So they're the ones who become experts on that sighting. So they'll know these are three minute whales or eight minute whales, or there's four in that group. So they keep track of that. So it really helps in being consistent and figuring out how many whales we have and what their behavior is. We look for things as a whale entangled. Sometimes we do get gray whales with entanglements. That's one of the big dangers for gray whales is getting entangled in fishing gear. We had an entanglement here and called on the uh, disentanglement team, which I'm a part of that team with NOAA Fisheries. And the team came out and uh, worked on freeing that whale, which was very exciting. The only other problem they have are ship strikes, being hit by boats, and that's a really big problem. I have photographs of quite a few gray whales that have propeller scars on them. So if boats are going slower than about 10 miles an hour, it's generally a survivable hit. If the boats are going faster than that, the gray whale might not survive or other whales. So a big cue for you is our ocean is so full of different species. When you're on the water, always have your eye out. Assume there are whales underwater. So if you see a blow, go really slow. Don't race up to it and always have somebody out watching because you don't want to hit a whale and it's not good for you or the whale. So we have all these, uh, besides the gray whales, we keep track of these other species that go by. For example, last season, which was season 37, we had, as of March 20th, we had a fin whale scene. We always write the last date, the most recent date that we've seen them. This is again used for the public too. Fin whale on the 18th of March. We had minke whale on March 9th, humpback whale March 10th. So these were all things that we'd seen multiple times. Common dolphin are our most common dolphin and see them just about every day. Two kinds of common dolphin, long-beaked and short-beaked. We can't usually tell them apart very easily from here. We saw them on our final day. Pacific white-sided dolphin, bottlenose dolphin, resos dolphin, false killer whales, which are, we used to see. We had our first year of the census back in 84 and many years we didn't see them. Since 2014, when we got this warm water blob, that was off the coast here, it raised the ocean temperatures. False killer whales, we believe, came up from Mexico. And so we had multiple sightings of them. Some of the same groups that we saw 2015 and 2018 were seen uh, two weeks ago off San Diego. So there's a, a group of killer whales that come up the coast, tends to be, we think, the same group. We even had a sperm whale too, and then there's other species we can see. So this is what we use to help educate the public and keep track of our, our whales. Okay, I have been interested in whales and dolphins as long as I could remember. Um, my dad loved to swim in the ocean. He was a uh, body surfer. One of my favorite activities was going to the beach. One of the earliest memories my parents have of me and the ocean was when I was, they say, about 18 months old, they took me to the beach and I was able to kind of toddle around and put me on the sand near the water and I went into the ocean screaming with delight and didn't want to get out. So they signed me up for swimming lessons when I was not even two years old. And I remember always trying to collect little, those little fishies in the water. Uh, I, as far as I can remember, I was reading everything on whales and dolphins. I watched Flipper, Jacques Cousteau, everybody be quiet, I need to listen to this stuff. And one of the seminal moments, a um, couple of them, my kindergarten teacher brought in a jar with a preserved octopus and I refused to go out to recess. I kept asking her questions about octopus, which she couldn't answer, and I decided that I was going to learn everything about the octopus, and that was still one of my favorite animals. But I remember being in the library, and I had a book on chimpanzees by Jane Goodall in one hand, sixth grade, 12 years old, and I had a book by John Lilly on bottlenose dolphin in the other hand, and I literally had that seminal kind of aha moment when I stood in the library and just felt like lightning and spotlight was hitting me and electrified and felt that this was like a life's decision here, that I 
These are two highly intelligent, very social animals with culture, long-lived, very charismatic. This is what I want to study. I'm really interested in apes and gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos. Kind of difficult for a California girl to study them in the wild. I'm also really interested in bottlenose dolphin, killer whales. This is what I want to do, but not in captivity. I want to study them in the wild. And back in the 60s at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of um, research being done. This was just the very beginning. So this was something I decided I really wanted to do. And, uh, Throughout my life, I was always interested in every opportunity of going to talks that people gave. I heard Jane Goodall talk, which was wonderful. I heard the Cousteau's talk. Um, every opportunity to educate, get involved, watching TV programs, and then later involved in the Cabrillo Whale Watch program, anything to do with whales. Just ate it up, consumed it, learning all about it. Particularly interested for me in gray whales, humpback whales, and also killer whales. I'm part of the uh, co-founder of the California Killer Whale Project, nonprofit, and study killer whales up and down the coast of California, and if they go into Mexico or up the coast, and knowing which killer whales are which, I'm interested in knowing individuals about their lives. Like this is a whale named CA-51 Star, and she's got four kids. She's got Orion and Bumper and um, Aurora and Comet and this is the most common group of killer whales we actually see out here. They were here on uh, May 9th, 2012 and actually attacked and killed a gray whale mom and calf along with another family, the CA-27s. 38 years, that's the only time we've ever seen an attack here. So my passions are all about whales, also about education. I'm a lifetime educator. So I'm one of those kind of rare scientists who I want to do field work, but I also want to kind of translate the science to the public, getting involved in giving talks, uh, educator at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium with the Cabrillo Whale Watch program. I taught Sam Peter High School Marine Science Magnet for 21 years, teaching marine biology and advanced marine science. Every opportunity I have to teach marine biology, natural history museum, fourth graders, ichthyology, uh, any opportunity to teach adults, to teach kids. I worked on boats, sea education afloat program for 10 years, a floating classroom in which I dove and pulled up animals and taught all about marine biology. Uh, so the impact you can have on people is absolutely amazing, particularly impact on children, taking thousands of kids out on the water, kids coming here, Point Vicente, uh, all kinds of opportunities to be able to educate the public, learn more about the animals, and then translate that love and enthusiasm for doing what we can to help preserve the animals and educate and conserve their environment. If you ever have the opportunity, try to get down to Baja, California. I've been down there over a dozen times to every lagoon down there. You go out, particularly San Ignacio, that's my favorite. It's the most pristine of the lagoons, about halfway down the Baja Peninsula. Uh, this year they had uh, 11 cow-calves pairs a couple weeks ago there. So it's, it's on the low side, but they are had the, they're finding the moms who have calves are in good condition and those calves are in really good condition. So you go out on a little uh, panga, little boat there with the locals. They're very knowledgeable, take you out in these little boats and you may have some whales approach you. And there's certain whales who decide they want to come up to the boat. And very strict policy there, you don't race up to them. You go out in the area, you talk to, uh, let the guy know with the radio, okay, I'm going to be here, you're limited to an hour and a half the little boat is. They check in and check out so they don't have too many boats in the area. You get in there and you may have a mom and calf, for example, come over and check out the boat. Some of these moms have been there. The first time that happened was around 1972, 71, when a, mom, um, a female came up to a boat and was chasing it. Fishermen thought it was going to get them. They were called devilfish because people used to go into the lagoons and they would, the whalers would shoot the calves and not kill them. And the moms would come over to defend them and the moms would sometimes swamp the boats. So they were called devilfish for protecting their kids. And they actually almost exterminated gray whales in the 1860s and again in the 1920s. And they've since come back from a few thousand to about 20,000 now. So if you get one of these boat friendly whales that can come up and put their face right against the boat and even sometimes raise their calf up out of the water, towards you and they feel sort of like soft living rubber. Really interesting and in the interaction you can get with the eyes looking at all the people in the boat. 
just touches your soul. You just look in those eyes and somebody's there and they're curious about you. You're in their area and they've chosen to spend that time with you. Whereas a hundred years ago, people would be there killing them. Now people are coming back. It's a renewable commodity and that people are coming back seeing the same individual whales in some cases for years, sometimes coming up and bringing their calves up to you. One of my most memorable times is when I was there in uh, I think 1985 and there had been a big storm just before and there hadn't been a boat in the lagoon for three days. We were the first ones in the lagoon, the first ones in the water. Literally a mother came leaping like porpoising, which gray whales don't do, but this one did, with her calf following her all the way to our boat at top speed. Circled us three times, shoved her calf out of the way and shoved her face against the boat. Like, pet me. Now, um, really interesting. People need to know not to expect to be able to touch. That is a privilege that's like icing on the cake. Just to be able to be there with those animals and be so trusted in that environment is um, just unparalleled. There have been some cases in which some gray whales have come up to boats recently even in California who might have been in Baja and been used to people coming up, uh, of coming up to people and kind of soliciting being touched. But this is a different place and you don't want to habituate them outside of the lagoons to be doing that. It's illegal to go over and try to pet a whale in California. So even if they really look like they want to, you know, be respective because you don't want them to go up to a boat in a bad situation, they might get hit by the boat, they might get caught in the propellers, but you might have some friendly grays and that's super special to get to see that. Uh, life expectancy of whales, it's really difficult for us to know exactly because for example for gray whales, we've been studying them in the wild in San Ignacio Lagoon since around 1972-73 and there's still some uh, whales that were there then that are there now. We know they can have calves as early as five or six years old. They could continue having a calf every one, two or three years. So we think they probably live to be 60, 80, maybe even 100 years old. So if you come back in 50 years, I could give you a better idea. But right now, we just really think from looking at layers in their earwax, um, we don't have photos from way back when. But that's what we think. For killer whales, for example, we think females are very likely to live to be 80, 100 or more years. Males, it's closer to maybe 60, even though the average lifespan is a lot shorter than that from what we've seen in the wild. We do believe that they potentially live that long. Humpback whales, probably at least 80, 90, 100, and same thing with blue whales. We just don't know yet. We know in captive situations how long that particular animal might have lived, but you can't translate that necessarily to the wild because uh, they're protected from predators. You could treat them if there's medical issues. They might be under more stress potentially in captivity too. So uh, it's gonna take a lot of years for us to know. But we know a lot of whales, for example, bottlenose dolphin. We know from 50 years of research that Dr. Randy Wells has done off of Sarasota, Florida. We know that um, the oldest females are in the mid 60s and they can give birth until at least their late 50s. And males are into their late 50s. So we think they're gonna live even longer than that. So here's a model of our gray whale. It's a gray whale is a baleen whale or a mysticity whale, a mustache whale. Mysticity means mustache. Got the two blowholes on top of the head and long back with a series of knuckles back here with the flukes with a smooth edge to it. Often have killer whale tooth rakes. Killer whales are their major uh, predator and uh, some people believe as many as 25 to 40 percent of gray whale calves potentially could be killed by killer whales. It's difficult to know exactly, but we do know, I do know that over half of the killer whales that I've seen have tooth marks on their body, particularly the tail. That could be from a calf that survived. It could be from a mom who protected its calf from killer whales either. They have this baleen, a brush-like substance that hangs down from their upper jaw. They've, this is a piece of the baleen, part of a rack of baleen. This is the gum, hangs from the upper left here. Looks like a comb on the outside and a brush on the inside. This is made out of keratin, a protein, the same material as your hair and fingernails is. Grows like your hair and fingernails and acts as a filter. So there's like over 180 plates of this on each side of their mouth. So gray whales and uh, other baleen whale species, about 180 to um, 400 pieces of this baleen hanging down in their mouth filtering the water and they, they go to the bottom primarily, they're benthic or bottom feeders, and they suck up this mud and they have two to five throat grooves here so they're able to expand and take in a lot of water. They use their tongue to push up the little shrimps, the gamerid amphipods, against this 
and push the water out along with any worms, crabs, fish, anything else that might be in there. So they actually plow the bottom and they resuspend all that substrate and it acts to fertilize the water. Plus as they're feeding, they're pooping too. And that helps add nutrients to the ecosystem, which helps keep it uh, nice and rich. So we have uh, probably about 20,000 gray whales in our population here. There's about 180 or so gray whales off of Russia, a small group that's, it's really interesting because they feed off Russia and people did not know where they bred at all. And several were tagged starting in about 2010. And what they found is the whales that were tagged, that the tags worked, all of them went across the Pacific Ocean and then started heading down our coast, which is what nobody believed would happen. Flex, a uh, big male, was one of them, and he got past point conception almost to this area. Varvara is a female who actually was tagged off Russia, and each one took a different route across the ocean. It's not like there was a narrow corridor. They just all went across the Pacific, went down the coast. Some that were seen and, and uh, re-encountered were traveling with other Russian whales. Most likely, uh, females were getting pregnant at that time because there seems to be a difference in genes between the gene pool from the group there and the group off this coast. Went down off the coast, she went down off here, and I was actually on a boat tasked with trying to find her and photograph her and see was she, if she was with anybody. But unfortunately, she went by, um, one time she went by, she was on the backside of Catalina, the other time she went the other way, she was at night, so I couldn't get out there. But she actually went to each lagoon in Baja. She was eight years old and about time to have her first calf. And she went inside San Ignacio Lagoon, stayed there for a day, went out, she basically checked out each of the lagoons, headed back up the coast, went back across the Pacific and went back to go Russia feeding. It was over a whole year that that tag worked. It's the longest tag ever on a baleen whale, which is absolutely amazing, great information. This is a fabulous place for you to bring your family, just come out, particularly during the week when there's fewer people here. Uh, it's a great facility. People uh, go walking, hiking. There's a long fence line here. We've got the uh, Point Vicente Lighthouse half a mile from us right here, which is a lighthouse that we would see from our other original spot in Marine Land. Off of here, we have a rock called Pyramid Rock that's shaped like a pyramid and whale rock. And these are landmarks for us when we see a gray whale coming uh, toward us. Whale rock here got its name. We had one volunteer who kept pointing at that rock and saying, there's a whale, there's a whale, there's a whale. But it wasn't, it was a rock that was producing if the waves hit just so and super high crash, it actually produces a blow, it looks like a blow. But she didn't care every time there was a splash. If every day she saw whales, it was actually a rock. So kind of in making in front of her and in honor of it looking like the blow of a whale, that's why we call that whale rock and it's a key point for us here. So you can see right now we've got visitors all along the fence line. The Interpretive Center has painted numbers along the fence posts that are for use for us originally, but also for them. So we sit, we're sitting here and spotting a whale and we're looking through our binoculars, which have compass and reticle in them. And the compass could tell us what direction the whale is for us. And the reticles will tell us how far from the horizon. And for the public, it doesn't help me to say, okay, it's at 320 degrees and 30 mil, that won't mean anything to them, but I could say it's over post 125. Depending upon where you are in the patio, that might be a little bit different, but it gives you a reference mark. So it's really helpful for them, but also for the interpretive center in case there's a little landslide or a person who's got some trouble or something's going on. Um, somebody climbed over the fence, which you don't wanna do. Stay on this side of the fence. Okay, this is a landslide area. Don't throw rocks, it's a landslide area. Please don't make our interpretive center disappear into the ocean. So hopefully you guys can come out and uh, see us here. We hope to be back open December 1st at, at uh, dawn and come out and watch and see what you can see out here. It's absolutely fantastic. We get ospreys uh, hunting for fish and occasionally a bald eagle, occasionally a sea otter. Uh, my favorite killer whales I've seen here so, quite a few times. So hopefully you come out and visit us and enjoy this absolutely fantastic facility at an unmatched area with over 20 different kinds of marine mammals and up teen birds.